Welcome to the Hayley Eich podcast. In today's episode, I am joined by Joe, who has managed to achieve a multi six figure investment account in 10 years at the age of 26. We get his insights into exactly how he has managed to achieve this, how he's lost money along the way, what his plans are with his account moving forward, and then we also go a little bit off topic and discuss diet. I really hope you guys enjoy. Welcome, Joe. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for coming on. Um, just quickly before we start, I want to thank you actually because you have been someone that has supported me from very, very early on. You know, you would you you reply to my email sometimes. You you tell me I'm doing a good job. So just just on a personal note, I, I appreciate you with all the support, and I think you're doing a wonderful job as well. But welcome. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I just, I mean, I give support to people who are always supportive to me. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, it, it doesn't go unnoticed. But we have a lot to speak about. Um, so uh, the, the main thing that I want I want to speak to you about and get your input and I guess your tips, your tricks, your pieces of advice for other people that may be listening is that you've managed to achieve something quite admirable, something that you know not a lot of people have managed to achieve at your age. And, and that is for the audience that you have managed to build yourself a multi six figure portfolio at the age of 26, I think it is. And you've done that in what 10 years a decade uh yeah correct i just hit that 10 year mark i want to say a couple of months ago Mm -hmm. um it's kind of it doesn't really feel like a long time to be honest 10 years Mm -hmm. in the stock market especially um when you start investing at 16 um at you dealing with other priorities and you know obligations in life like school and you know family whatnot Mm -hmm. um but it's kind of funny how it started when Cause like my parents, they were investing, you know, for a while before I was, you know, back in their thirties and forties. And then my parents wanted me to start investing early because they said, you know, financial success Mm -hmm. is financial freedom and security and whatnot. So, um, but they did it right. They had me go to, um, they had me open an account with Chase Bank Mm -hmm. and then they had me go see a wealth, um, what you call like a wealth portfolio manager Mm -hmm. or like a wealth advisor every quarter. And wow. this, this guy would actually sit down with me every quarter and explain to me exactly like how the fund I was in was performing, mm-hmm. um, why maybe it took a dip and why it was growing and whatnot. And of course, you know, I'm 16 at the time, I did not understand anything he was mm-hmm. talking about. So if I saw it going up, I was like, are oh, you doing a great job? That's, mm-hmm. that's great. But um, I think it came time like around 2020, when I realized when the market sold off, and I'm like, I actually want to get more into like, stock trading and investing on my own because at that time I had a lot of friends from college who were you know like heavy in investing um a couple people who've like done extremely well prior to COVID so they were like basically waiting for a dip like this to get in and I was like okay so that's when I liquidated my whole uh portfolio in uh with my you know with my Chase Bank my mm-hmm. my fund Um, and then I started going in on like ETFs, individual stocks, and then, you know, a little bit of like options trading, which, you know, you learn fairly quick with options because you can lose a lot. You can make a lot of money and I've lost a lot. I've made a lot. So it's, I won't lie in that sense. Um, but it's, it's really funny on the note that, you know, when you liquidate like a fund and you have like someone managing it, you know, the next day. I had that portfolio manager like reach out to me. He goes, is everything okay? Because I saw you liquidated everything. I said, yeah, I want to get more into like individual stocks and ETFs in my own, you know, style of trading. And he goes, oh, okay. I just don't recommend that because right now in this market, it's very volatile. And then I realized in the span of like maybe three or four months, like keep in mind, I had this portfolio with them for, um, you know, I want to say like quite a few years in the span of three to four months. Um, I made more gains by myself than I did having my money with him. And then I realized I should probably just keep my own money, manage my own money. Um, so it's been pretty good ever since. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot lot to unpick there. I guess let's just start at the beginning. You started at age 16. Like that is pretty uncommon. You know, I've not heard many people that have, I suppose, I, I was going to ask you, was there someone influencing you? But you've kind of... You kind of said that maybe it was your parents. I'm guessing they were the biggest, the biggest influences for you. So they guided you at 16, which is is pretty impressive. Do they still invest and use fund managers, or are they doing their own thing as well now? 
Um, they still do. Yeah, they still do invest. Um, it's more of like my dad, who's like the heavy investor. Yeah. Um, you know, we do have like, you know, certain funds that's managed by people and he'll like manage some of his own funds. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes we'll discuss like, Hey, let's get into this stock or this stock and we'll kind of discuss why we want to get into it. Um, and then I have a few friends, um, who are in, what do you call it? They're like analysts at certain mm -hmm. firms. So I'll ask them, you know, without, you know, giving, you know, deep information out, mm -hmm. but they'll be like, yeah, I, you know, we can look into this stock for you. And they'll, they'd be able to give me like, you know, an honest breakdown, mm -hmm. like of why they think that stock is a good buy or why, maybe why you should be a little bit standoffish from it. So it's always good to have, you know, support from both sides. Like, you know, sometimes a stock can win because you have a gut feeling and the stock just plays out. And sometimes you have a little bit more like statistical analysis, mm -hmm. which is, I feel like it's a very overused word, but I only like to use that word with, you know, friends of mine who actually work for, um, you know, like firms, yeah. like wealth portfolio firms where they actually are breaking down these stocks, like on a statistical level and mm -hmm. seeing like, okay, this stock can actually perform in the future due to X, Y, yeah. and Z. Do you think that most people should start with a fund? Do you think like, because you said you ended up making, you know, way more gains in individual stocks than you did when, when you were, when you were invested into a fund and you had a fund manager managing that fund. But do you think that that's the logical place for most people to start and actually start understanding investing rather than just going straight in for, for individual stocks? Because I imagine you learned a lot from that guy originally, even though you ended up doing better on your own. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question when it comes to like investing your own money. Um, mm -hmm. I like to think that I do a lot of like due diligence when it yeah. comes to research on stocks. And I know there's people out there who do a lot more due diligence, but for like the average investor who's my, maybe like new to investing, um, mm -hmm. I would honestly highly recommend like a fund because um, I'm not an expert, but when I look at others I know of who got into investing, a lot of people I know of have lost a lot of money because yeah tip like they listen to their friends and that's sometimes not the best idea and then sometimes i'll go on you know x and i'll hear people recommending stocks and those stocks would be up like a hundred percent and like the last year like you look at palantir you look at tesla mm -hmm. and you have you know very smart people breaking these stocks down and why they think it's going to be successful long term and they actual actually back it up with reason not like oh i think this is going to 10x just because i have a gut feeling just because it's cool yeah yeah and i've had i've had friends who you know they have like friends I went to college with and they have portfolios, you know, however many times fold bigger than mine. Mm -hmm. And that's where they kind of inspired me to manage my own money. But how they all started out was with a fund because in the beginning, you know, I think it's important to have someone kind of overlook, mm -hmm. you know, your investments and go like, Hey, like we've been doing this for a while because we've made a lot of mistakes, but now we know how to manage money and investments. Mm -hmm. And then to a certain point, um, maybe like you kind of wean your way into investing on your own. Like I had a buddy I went to college with, um, he has a multiple like seven figure portfolio and that's wow. kind of boggles my mind that he's 26, <laughs> but he goes, I started out with, uh, funds where, you know, he had a wealth portfolio manager manage it. And then, um, after a certain point, he said, I'm going to wean my way into, um, you know, investing on my own. So then he started investing 20% of his money into, you know, on his own, like in individual stocks and ETFs, but he still had the majority of his money locked up, you know, with someone managing his money because he figured, you know, they knew what they were doing. And then eventually he, you know, migrated his way to 50%. And I think he still has like 50% managed by somebody. And then he manages his own 50%. He goes, because it's easy sometimes to go like full tilt if you're doing extremely well in the market and you want to like double down on something, you get a little too overly optimistic. Yeah. Like there should be a point where you like you draw the line because you can't read the market. So mm -hmm. kind of hard to know when to stay conservative and when to stay like kind of greedy. Yeah. And I suppose that is always going to be individual, isn't it? I think with fund managers, it's I guess it's about I've never had one, so I can't. I can't comment on personal experience, but I suppose it's about finding the right one and then realizing that as well, fund managers are obviously, they're there to do a certain job. They're not necessarily there to maybe, you know, 100x your money. They're very much there to grow your portfolio over a long period of time, maybe, you know, risk off a little bit more than the average individual stock investor. Personally, I've never had a fund manager, like I just said, but I did also start with funds 
you know, just your typical Vanguard index funds, ETFs. And then, you know, I gradually worked my way up to where I am now. But am I right in understanding that you, so you've tried mutual funds, penny stocks, and like you just mentioned, options before you ended up where you are today. Can you just talk about maybe your experiences with that and what, what you learned along the way? Because it sounds like you've been, you know, you've been in a lot of different areas of the market. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, especially like back in uh, 2019, that's when like mm -hmm. the first like crypto sell off happened. Yeah. I think crypto took like a 30% sell off. Um, that's when I was like extremely new to like Robinhood. I threw a little bit of money in there. And at the time, you know, you see like a $100 sell off and you're very new to investing, you kind of freak out because yeah. you just lost your money. Yeah. But um, I realized like soon enough, um, especially since people recommended you might want to start paper trading first, just to get an idea like what your, you know, tolerance is when you mm -hmm. lose money, because a lot of people, you know, can lose money and they just can't stand it. They don't like it. And some people can lose, you know, half their portfolio and be fine with it. They know it'll come back. Um, so I started paper trading, you know, back in like 2019. And then I said, I'm just going to get into it, just dive into it. And in the beginning, I was buying like penny stocks and whatnot, and I was losing a little bit of money because they didn't, re they didn't really go anywhere. And the mm -hmm. same thing with a little bit of crypto, but I didn't start touching like options trading until when COVID happened. And then it was going well, but in the end, I want to say I did end my options like in the green, but it was more of a learning lesson that, you know, options, I don't believe like, we're not talking selling options. We're talking mm -hmm. like you buy the option, like a call option. Um, it was more of like a learning lesson that, you know, you can't put a lot of money into that because it's either it's going to do extremely well or it's going to expire worthless and you don't get that premium back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that money, it's, it's, it takes a long time to work for that. So I realized, you know, especially for like going back to like the new investor, uh, if you don't want to go to an advisor, you know, you could always buy, you know, like a, an ETF, like the Vanguard mm -hmm. ETF, the SPY ETF. And I mean, historically, I don't think that's a bad idea. I think it's a great idea. It pays a dividend. It has substantial growth. Um, it's very liquid, the most liquid mm -hmm. that I've seen. Um, and that's when I realized like, okay, you can, you know, kind of chase the trend, but you know, it's not like a long-term thing or you could kind of go probably like the easier route and just invest and forget about it. Mm -hmm. like yeah, I don't. I don't think that, you know, it is the boring way by a lot of a lot of standards, but actually boring doesn't have to be bad. You know, boring over a long time, over decades can literally lead to financial freedom. Are you going to outdo the market? No, you're, you're going to get market average returns, but that, that is not to be sniffed at. You know, market average returns can lead to financial freedom. So, yeah, I completely agree with what you were saying there. In terms of losing money, what were you losing money on? Did you, did you say penny stocks or options or a bit of everything? A um, bit of everything. I remember I sold like when I had like crypto, like Bitcoin and, you know, Ethereum at the time and Dogecoin, um, you know, when they sold off back in 2019, I like sold it at a loss because it just, okay. I'm new to this and mm -hmm. I wanted to cut my losses. And then, of course, during COVID, they just went really high up. Um, the penny stocks, Ironically enough, a couple of those penny stocks got reverse stock splitted, which is what you don't want to happen when yeah. you lose more of your shares. And that's kind of a red flag, like maybe you shouldn't be buying penny stocks. Um, and then with the options trading, I remember um, it was extremely good in the beginning. And then I was starting to lose money as options tends to happen. Stocks don't always go up. And then I figured maybe I need a different strategy, you know, like better than like a long term call option. So I started following, you know, Nancy Pelosi's trades. So I'm like, she's winning Very a lot. So I started going online and saying, what is she buying? And then all of a sudden, within like the next like six months, I started winning a lot. And I said, this is great. I'm just following, you know, her trades and I'm winning money. I'm like, this mm -hmm. is definitely not suspicious, but you know, <laughs> um, but it was just a lot of like anxiety. Some people have the tolerance to play options. Um, at the time I did it. And I'll be honest, I went about two and a half years without touching options, like two years ago. And then in the last probably like th two to three months I got back into it but I've been extremely conservative because you know I was a little delusional in the past with options but I got back I got back into options in the last couple of months where I set a standard mm -hmm. um, I'm only putting like literally one percent of my net worth into options and okay, that's it's, very conservative. yeah it's it's tech companies where I look at and I go okay what can this stock be at in like the next couple of years and a lot of people might disagree, but I bought like long terms, like mm 
mm -hmm. um, Amazon, NVIDIA, and I bought these stocks like a year and a half, two years out, not in the money, but like we're talking maybe like $15, $20, you know, strike price out. Mm -hmm. So feeling very bullish on those stocks. And luckily, you know, one of them is up, the other's not. But I figured, okay, if I buy these like long term, you're paying, you're paying more in premium. That's a fact. But the odds that they're going to be in the money by the time of expiration is mm -hmm. highly likely. And plus, I could forget about it. If there were an option that expired like in November and December, especially right, you know, when the feds are looking at cutting rates, yeah. there's inflation, election, and we have an election, yeah. Yeah. then it's like, okay, uh, they're probably going to expire worthless, to be honest. So I figured, okay, I'll just buy it like two years out. And that's what most of the politicians here do. They buy long-term call mm -hmm. options near the money and somehow they always win big. So I wonder, I wonder yeah, how I wonder that why. is. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that's been kind of like my, um, my plan in like the last couple mm -hmm. of months. But I think it's great though that, um, you know, you set a standard like, oh, I'm not going to put 50% of my net worth onto options. I'm going to try with 1%. So if I lose that 1%, it won't financially cripple me. I think that's what's most important. Mm -hmm. I want to dive into your portfolio a little bit. But before we do that, I want to, I'm going to try and summarize in my own words, how you've been able to build a portfolio in terms of the amount that you've got invested, as you have. And I'll make it really, really simple. I'll cut it back to basics. And then you just add anything that you think is important that I'm missing. So you've obviously started a long time ago. So you started early you've been consistent, you've added money regularly, and then you've worked your butt off to earn extra money through your job, through whatever else you, you may have going on, I don't know. And you've added all the spare money that you can into it to, to, to get to your goal. And on top of that, you've done a lot of research, you've worked hard to understand the companies that you're picking and you're investing and you've, you know, knuckled down on the conviction. Would you would you add anything? Is that even a fair analysis? Yeah, that's, that's pretty fair. Um, I, I think especially in like the last couple of years, like, well, 2022, I got, I don't want to say lucky, but I was very fortunate because I work in the freight business where, mm -hmm. in short, um, uh, I don't know, do you have Costco and Walmart over in the we, UK? We have Costco um, in selected areas and um, no to Walmart, but we do have the, I want to say like twin version of it. I think there's a, there's a store here called Asda and I think they're owned by the same people. I could be wrong though. Oh, great. Okay. So, you know, like those giant 18 wheeler trucks that back in like the, you yes. know, the doors. So mm -hmm. my job um, is basically like to find those trucks, okay. whether it's a dry trailer or a refrigerated trailer. And we have them, we negotiate a rate to pick up from like point A, wherever that is. And then they pick up the product and deliver it to like Costco. Okay. And then we get paid, which is great. And we have like, you know, contracted rates and whatnot, whether it's like, mm -hmm. you know, companies like hypothetically like Costco or Walmart. And, you know, 2022 was the best, you know, year we've had in the freight market. Rates were just great. We're making, our margins were great. So that was a big year for me to invest because um, it was just like, you know, bonuses were great. The pay was great. Um, and of course, freight market's great when it's great. But right now here in the United States, the freight market's hurting a lot because, you know, margins are not the best. Um, consumer sentiment, they say it's still really good, but with a lot of the crippling debt that people have, mm -hmm. I don't think they're really spending as much as they want to. So, you know, that means that shippers aren't providing as much, um, well, they're not needed as much because the customers such as, you know, maybe Walmart, Coca-Cola, uh, Costco, maybe they're not ordering as much because the consumer sentiment maybe isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, but aside from that, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that's a very fair analysis, you know, just investing hard regularly. I think that's the most important part. Yeah. So you, you know, you've been able to get to where you are, not having been just gifted loads of money. You've, you, I'm trying to point out to people that, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this and you're thinking, oh, you know, Joe's obviously very fortunate. I could never get there. You can, you know, you absolutely can. You have to put in the work and you have to be patient because it, these things don't happen overnight. And yeah, like you said, you have to have somewhat of luck on your side. And I don't mean luck in terms of you picking a good company just out of luck. I just mean the market conditions, which none of us know what's going to happen. You know, we, we, we can see some things coming like it's an election year. It might be a bit rocky, but we don't know what could just happen next week that could completely change the market. So there is that element of the unknown and, and luck. Um, but yeah, do you have do you have any final, you know, final tips for people that maybe 
want to build a portfolio like you, but right now that they're nowhere near? Um, I would say, you know, when you look at like the amount or like maybe how much you want to invest, um, I don't think it should be discouraging in any sense because I've had a yeah. lot of people like be very discouraged, like, well, how can I get to like that type of thing? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I was talking to a buddy of mine yesterday at work and make this very brief. Um, and, you know, I always tell him like, hey, the market's up, but I only tell him when the market's up because he likes that. And he's been <laughs> wanting to invest more. And he just doesn't know how to, and he's investing like cannabis stocks and he's lost money. I said, okay, don't, don't do that. So I told him, um, you have your Robin account. I said, I would recommend maybe automatic investments mm -hmm. and then set an amount that's not going to hurt you financially, but that's comfortable. And then once you buy like a certain holding, uh, just close the app and then just remove it from your phone. Yeah. It'll automatically purchase, whether it's once a week, every two weeks, like every pay period. And he's, um, He's been doing that now for like six months. And he's like, oh, I have like, you know, X amount of money now. My profile, I completely forgot about my like, great, like your 401k. Um, but in the beginning, he, he was <clears throat> discouraged because he was comparing himself to like my portfolio when I showed him like what I had. And I said, don't be discouraged because I've been working on this portfolio for a while. It takes time. It takes effort, you know, and it takes consistency. And of course, fast forward six months. Now he has, you know, a decent amount in his portfolio. He goes, wow, I'm actually starting to see it grow now. Because in the beginning, that first step is the hardest, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's most discouraging because, you know, I look on X and I see a lot of people who have portfolios much bigger than mine. And I'll be honest, yeah, there's always someone. we shouldn't be comparing to other people. But sometimes I look at portfolios in like the seven figure mark and I'm like, I'm going to catch up to you. Just watch. But <laughs> it's inspiring. It shouldn't be um, discouraging. You look at that and go, how long has it taken for that individual to grow that portfolio, mm -hmm. right? So if I would, if I can say anything to anyone listening, I would say don't let it be discouraging, even if it's a portfolio that's, you know, five, six, seven, eight figures. Just look at it and go, what did they do that I'm not doing? And most likely it's just the hard work, you know, good investments and consistent investing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think even though these are these are things that I said time and time again, I think they're so important, like time in the market, more important than time in the market. Like we all say this, but do we actually believe it? And do we actually live through that in our own portfolios? I don't know. Um, and also you made a you made a good point there about comparison. Like there's no point in someone comparing themselves or, you know, their portfolio to someone that's in a, a completely different stage. You need to compare your portfolio or yourself to someone when they were where you were. Like people look at Warren Buffett now and, you know, they say this, this and this. But actually, what was Warren Buffett doing back when he was accumulating the majority of his wealth? Because that's where you are now. So making the comparisons actually applicable, I think, is really, really important. And you, you also said there about how you told your friend, you know, set it and forget it. Don't keep looking. And that's something that I think I say a lot, but I don't actually do. But I want to give myself some leeway there. I think it's because I'm creating content and also you know, I'm just a bit obsessed. So I like to continuously think about what I'm owning. But yeah, for the average person, I think just having a strategy, sticking to it and just continuing to add money goes a long, long way. I think you're absolutely right. Um, so let's talk about your portfolios. I don't actually know if you have more than one. Do you have multiple portfolios? Um, yeah, so the only portfolio I really post about is my Robinhood, but I do have, right. uh, like that's my side portfolio. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, when I was, so last year when I decided to, you know, invest, you know, heavy into the market, um, I think I started with like around 30,000 in my portfolio. This was like, actually, this was like December of 20, we're in 2024. So I think December of 2022. Okay. And, um, actually I honestly don't remember off the top of my head, but I wanted to start and see how fast I could break six figures. And I remember from like December to that following year um, in August, I broke six figures and I was like, oh, that was fun, you know, because it was just hard work investing, right? And just consistency and then a little bit of the market being in your favor. And a lot of that growth was uh, tech stocks. Mm -hmm. But I'll be honest, like once I hit the six figures, I got really complacent because you look at that amount and you go, wow, you're sitting fat and happy. And I didn't like that because you know, like the journey was probably like the most fun part. And then once I got there, I felt kind of like slightly empty. I was like, this is not mm -hmm. fun anymore. So that's when, and this was actually this past August. So last August, I did an account transfer to my main brokerage, like Schwab. And then mm -hmm. I started over, I don't remember the amount. It was something like less than $2,000. And I said, I'm just going to like buy again and try to figure out which holdings I want to keep purchasing. 
um, I wasn't playing options at the time. I was just purchasing tech stocks and other, you know, like ETFs and whatnot and see how fast I could build my way back up to six figures. And it was very humbling, especially like when you start out almost like at baseline because you're not seeing these heavy swings in your portfolio anymore. It's like a 20 or $30 swing. Yeah. So, um, and I believe it's already been one year since then because it's already August again. I think my Robinhood just broke 53,000 again. And I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, we're almost back up there. Um, but holdings wise, most of my portfolio, excuse me, I, have to, I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, I've got a screenshot of one of your portfolios, but I didn't, I don't know which one it is. Um, but yeah, you, you tell us. <laughs> okay, yeah. So basically, um, I have a little bit of options in my Robinhood right now, like long term mm -hmm. options expiring, you know, like a year and a half, a uh, little bit of like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, mm -hmm. I've never really been heavy in crypto. But um, have a little bit in both. And then my main holdings are like NVIDIA, Amazon, Apple, um, you know, Tesla, and then a couple others, which I have like a dollar in just to, you know, keep my eye on them, like mm -hmm. Kava and Home Depot. And, you know, I just, I think they're great stocks to own, you know, long term. Um, did I say Tesla as well? Yes, you did. Yeah. And, you know, I do think that those stocks are going to do extremely well long term, especially with the whole ai play mm -hmm. um especially since you know they're going to require a lot of energy and that's going to lead to other things like more energy stocks thriving i think they're going to thrive as well even though i don't own energy yeah. stocks i'd rather invest in tech stocks to be honest i can stomach the volatility as we've seen you know in the last two weeks mm -hmm. um but yeah that's that's my portfolio breakdown um and then of course on my other uh platform i have like a couple like different accounts like another brokerage um, in Schwab, you can have multiple accounts. So I have like a Roth IRA, my brokerage account, and then I have like a real estate fund. Okay. Um, and it's like, okay, I just have like a growth ETF in that real estate fund where like every paycheck I put like a you know, certain amount of money into it. And it's been grow it's been growing, you know, steadily. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's something where I won't mind having to sell, you know, down the road yeah. because, you know, if I were to ask you, would you rather put a hundred thousand down on a home and you'd have to sell like a hundred thousand worth of Palantir or a hundred thousand worth of like an ETF. I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. you probably want to sell that ETF because yeah, you're right there. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like your child, right? The Palantir. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of where I stand at the moment. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so many things going through my head here. I want to talk about the whole mindset thing because you mentioned earlier that, you know, you started from ground zero and it was humbling and also in your podcast um, that you, your podcast episode that you did, where you spoke about your journey to to get into this point in your portfolio, which I'll leave linked below, by the way, you should everyone should go and check it out. But you you speak a lot about psychology and mindset in there. And I think that's really, really important. So let's let's touch on that in a minute. But for now, let's just stay in your portfolio a bit longer. In terms of the amount that you've invested, which is your largest position? Is it NVIDIA or? Um, it's NVIDIA. Okay. And what about in terms of which position has done the best for you? Is that also the same answer? Yeah. It's all from NVIDIA, yeah. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the type of companies that you have, I mean, you know, you've said it yourself, they are majority tech companies. But what has been your journey in terms of dividend stocks and growth stocks and specifically, you know, stocks surrounding oh, AI and tech? Great question. Um, so when I was like investing like the first round, you know, my Robinhood account, mm -hmm. I was, um, you know, investing a lot into dividend stocks. Like so interesting. Like, I did the same. And Joe, do you know what? The more people I speak to, the exact same story comes out. I literally made a video and I, uh, the other day, and this is something that I spoke about because it just keeps popping up. Everyone seems to start with ETFs or, or funds, index funds, whatever. Then they move to dividends and then they move to growth and then they narrow down to a particular type of growth stock. Anyway, sorry to interrupt you. It just keeps happening. It's a pattern. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a very a common pattern I'm seeing. So um, basically, like when the Nasdaq sold off in 2022, was it, you know, sold off like 35 yeah. percent. That's when all the dividend stocks were the most popular. All the defensive stocks were doing well. The dividend payouts were, I think, like the highest, one of the highest in history. And I said, <clears throat> OK, and I was looking at dividend stocks, but then I realized like, you know, they're all time. I'm like, they're not really performing that well. They're very flat because they're defensive, you know, they pay dividends. Mm -hmm. And at the time I kind of got caught in that mentality of, you know, buying high paying dividend stocks. I said, oh. you need a lot of, you need a lot of equity to 
get a lot in return from dividend stocks. And I think at the time, my, I don't know what term you call it, the, the dividend, like, payout, whatever you would call it, like, per like year. Yield? Yeah, I think it was, like, $2,000 a year. I was like, oh, that's okay. great. It's going to take a lot more to build that up. And then I realized when the market pulled back, you know, started to pull back, I said, now dividend stocks started to become a little bit less popular. And I said, oh, so this was kind of like a phase. Um, so then I just got rid of the dividend stocks. And then I went mm -hmm. back into the ETFs and like the growth stocks. And I said, okay, the growth stocks have outperformed over time, you know, and I'll die on that hill. Um, but I do think that it's not a bad thing to, you know, look at defensive or dividend stocks because you know they do pay a dividend and there is benefit to owning them oh absolutely um, but in my position i'd rather own growth stocks and etfs i mean a lot of those etfs most etfs do pay a dividend um but i mean i'm in it for the growth because it's going to outperform most dividend stocks and plus i think it's uh, more fun to own them because you're going to see it grow more substantially yeah i suppose the motivation comes in different ways for different people i think i think for a while, when I was interested in dividend stocks, I did find that very motivating because you see the the payment come in and you reinvest it and, you know, that sort of gives you a little bit of a buzz. But then in terms of the growth stocks, you're absolutely right. They're more volatile. You can, they're, they're more, they're normally, and this depends on the person that you are, I suppose, they're normally more interesting companies to study as well, I find. Um, but yeah, you don't have to just pick one or the other. It's not, you know, it's not a cult. You can just do, what, do what's best for you. Um so in terms of NVIDIA, I know you're big on, on, on NVIDIA and you've done very well with that position. It's a company that I also like, although it's not my biggest position. Do you remember when you first started a position and like the main reasons why back then? I suppose it's changed over time, but... I think I started buying NVIDIA back in 2021. Okay, quite a while ago. Back when it was like around 300 a share and then I mm -hmm. bought majority, if I'm not mistaken, between like 250 to 300 a share. Nice. And then, yeah, that time it sold off to like a hundred, almost a hundred a share. It sold off pretty heavy. And then that's when I just started like adding more, but I didn't mm -hmm. think it would rebound as much as it did because, you know, at the time I wasn't like really in tune with the whole AI thing. I, that wasn't really being discussed a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was like up until, um, you know, like mid like 2023, I started reading more about this AI and I said, wow, mm -hmm. AI seems like it's really going to be something, but no one was talking about it. So I started buying more NVIDIA and like doubling down on it. And that's when I took a lot of my dividend stock holdings, like, mm -hmm. like that Schwab dividend ETF, that SCH that people love so much. And oh, I just yeah. threw that into it. A couple other like biopharmaceutical stocks, which were high paying dividends, like Merck, Amgen, mm -hmm. threw that into NVIDIA. And then also NVIDIA just, you know, took off. It was like the golden child. Yeah, um, I know. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. And then they stock split. I was like, great. Now, personally, I think in like the next two to three years, I can see NVIDIA splitting again. Oh, yeah. And, they carry on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why like the first time when it split, you know, this past year, um, I was telling my parents too, I'm like, I'm preparing for the next split. And they're like this 10 to one. I said, no, no, no the following split. And like, mm -hmm. you're already playing that far ahead. I said, yeah, I think the next split is probably going to be maybe a three to one. That's mm -hmm. my guess. And I don't know how much it's going to grow. I mean, it's rebounded a lot. But if you think about it, I think for every penny NVIDIA goes up, it's something like $4 million, $40 million added to its market cap. And then a dollar is something like $4 billion. I can't really fathom that number too much like in this current market because in the past that number would have been insane. Mm -hmm. Like, But NVIDIA has contributed, I want to say, something like a third of the S&P gains for this year. Like, yeah, it's been it, mental. I can't fathom that idea that it's just one company has contributed that much gains. Yeah, well, day. I mean, in five days, just looking at the previous past five days, it's up over 17%. But before that, it was obviously falling a little bit. So it just goes to show you how quickly these companies can turn around. And obviously, you know, we've got the earnings coming up at the end of the month. I think it's 28th, if I'm not mistaken. And looking back at what NVIDIA's done in the previous earnings, I imagine there's a lot of anticipation. There's a lot of people buying, ready to, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news type of thing. We, we see it every time. Um, for you, do you play into any of that or do you just stick to your strategy and, and that's, you know, what, regardless? Are you still like buying regularly or do you like to look at how it's doing? Do you see what I'm asking? Like, do you pay much attention to the stock or do you just sort of buy and buy and ignore? Um, yeah, I, I basically buy and ignore, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't, I'm not the type of person to really like play earnings. I know a lot of people are, they like to yeah. look into that. 
Um, I've never been like the type of person who wanted to be like, oh, earnings, I think it's going to go to this price, you know, I'm going to buy options. Um, Because it can go either which way, but I think that NVIDIA, I think it's going to do just fine after earnings. Um, You know, I was talking to my buddy who works, he's like a senior analyst, whatever, you know, but he was saying, you know, after earnings, you could see NVIDIA pump back up to 140 a share. It's very easy, you know, because he's like, there is, there are trillions of dollars on the sidelines that people don't have invested Mm -hmm. Um, they don't, you know, like whether they're liquidating bonds or whatnot, a lot of people just have sitting cash right now and they don't know what to do with their money. Like gold is almost, it's like almost basically an all, all time high, but then these tech stocks almost like an all time high. So it's like, usually like, where do you put your money type of thing in this market? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people right now are trying to be like opportunists, like trying to make, you know, a quick buck, trying to scalp, you know, what they can, or, you know, like us, we're just buying and holding. So I'm just going to keep buying regularly. I think the video will do fine on earnings. Um, but I think they're on to really big things considering that new Blockwell chip that they came out with. Um, I was asking him about that. I said, what do you think about the fact that, um, you know, the CEO, he said that we're expecting to see revenue this year. And he goes, that's actually like very big news because usually companies, when they come out with technology like that, it takes a few years to recoup you know, to Mm -hmm. actually break even when it comes to like revenue. And the fact that they already said we're supposed to be seeing revenue this year, the same year they're releasing it, he's like, that's like unheard of. He's like, so it shows they're years ahead of their competition and they just are sitting on so much money and like, you know, ingenuity Mm -hmm. that he's like, I just see everyone is just sitting on the sidelines. Like, what is this going to do? He's like, either you're already invested in on it because it's already grown so much. I see if he thinks it's going to grow a lot more. Mm -hmm. Um, but he doesn't have like a specific price target in mind. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the thing, isn't it? Over the long term, I think companies like NVIDIA, Amazon, obviously for me, Palantir, Tesla as well for you, we obviously think with strong certainty that these companies are going to do very, very well over the long term, whether they're going to do well in terms of gains over the next five days or one month, I don't know. (laughs) And I'm not ready to to put my money to guess that either. I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing. There obviously was that, um, Blackwell delay that was announced and that caused a little bit of a a sell-off momentarily but it seems to be okay now um I think with earnings like you said it could go either way you know they could do very very well in terms of what they report and the stock could react to that and go up or they could do very very well and the stock could go down (laughs) there's really no knowing and I suppose I suppose that's why it's good to have a little bit of cash on the sidelines in case that that latter scenario happens and they do very well but the stock goes down you can maybe buy more if that's what you want to do um but let's let's circle back to the mindset thing because i I think a lot of people could maybe get get some value from this so talk to me about how your what you noticed happened in your mind during the process of actually building that portfolio and once you had achieved it because maybe i I think in your podcast episode you kind of alluded to the idea of it didn't actually feel like it was going to feel you know I'll hand it over to you. Oh, yeah, no, that's 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 a great point. Um, I've noticed like when you work on a portfolio, it's exciting because you're actively thinking about it and you actively have like a goal or you know that presence mm-hmm. in mind that you know I want to hit that certain goal. And maybe you're uh, you're being like optimistic, which that's a good thing. You should always mm-hmm. be optimistic about your portfolio. But the journey, in my opinion, is probably like the most fun because you look back on your investments. Whether they're learning lessons or, you know, great choices, you look at that and you look at it in the spirit of like, oh, these are good things. I've learned from not to invest in these things. I've learned to stomach these things. And I think it all comes down to experience. You know, it's like if you're too rash and, you know, you have too many knee jerk reactions and you're maybe like, I'm going to sell because I can't take the sell off. That's one thing. But then I feel like once you hit that end of the road, um, you're feeling a little bit empty because now the race is over. And then you realize no matter, you know, how long you're running for, you know, figuratively in that race with mm-hmm. investing, the most fun part was the running, whether you like it or not, because it's like, it's the struggle. And that's the nice part is because there's like essentially no cap that you can build on your portfolio. And I mean, a lot of people ask me, like quite a few ask me, like, what's your goal? Like financially, I'm like, I don't really have a goal. Once I started, I figured, you know, what if I can just try to build the biggest like behemoth of a portfolio possible because there's no cap financially, which is great. So why would you say, I don't know, maybe like half a million or a million or, you know, 10 million. 
why not go for as much as you can, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the most part. I feel like you shouldn't set a limit. And I think that's like comes down to um, basically just like expanding the mind, you know, like opportunity, because I feel like we're maybe sometimes capping ourselves mentally on how high we think we can achieve on a portfolio. Uh, I think we're, we're probably just not giving ourselves enough credit on how much we can actually achieve. So that's like the biggest part. Mm hmm. Yeah, it, it's, I guess the goalpost is just continuously moving as you move through. You hit 10,000 and then it's suddenly 100,000 and then, you know, half a million and it just, it, you know, skipping some there, obviously. It just keeps moving and then it just feels like nothing is actually good enough. But actually what you've already managed to achieve is amazing. But why give yourself these stringent goals? Why not just focus on the companies that you're investing into and let the rest happen for you, I suppose? Um, you, you kind of hinted there about you don't necessarily have a goal amount in mind, but do you have like plans for your future in terms of your portfolio? Like, is this, do you want to carry, I guess a few questions here. Do you want to carry on buying the same companies or do you see that changing? Um, and then in terms of, do you, do you plan to take any profit at any point? And if so, what would, would that be used for? Maybe a house, maybe, you know, one day you want a family and you want to pass some down. I don't know. What, what's the bigger picture here for you? Yeah, that's that's something I've been thinking about a lot in like the last few years. Um, you know, like when you look at these individual stocks, you know, they are kind of like your children. Like, I want to feed them equally. I want to invest in them <laughs> equally, whether it's like Nvidia, Amazon, Apple, Tesla. I'm a bit biased um, towards my children, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> um, but like you know, down the road, I'd be very hesitant to sell. I think that's why after I built up like you know, um, you know, like a reasonable amount of you know my portfolio in like the last few years. I figured like, oh, now I can kind of take a slight step back and invest more into like ETS because um, I wouldn't have any, you know, um, what do you call it? Any, you know, harsh feelings against selling that ETF because it's not really more of like a personal attachment. You've not put time to understand it in, I suppose. Co correct. Yeah. And plus, um, especially with like these individual stocks, you look at a lot of like those big players out there who own a lot of those individual stocks, like a large percentage. And you look at like their average cost and they've just like bought it and they've just held it. Mm -hmm. And depending on how much they own, sometimes they'll trim a little bit if they want to put it somewhere. And we see that all the time, you know, with certain stocks where they go, oh, this person sold this much in their stake and they're probably putting it in like real estate or probably like for tax purposes. Um, but I don't know if I would honestly sell my individual stocks down the road. It would really depend. But um, as of right now with like how much that I built in individual stocks, um, which is, it's, it's, it's a humbling amount. I think it's time for me like to step back a little bit and to put more of like a majority of my money into like that, you know, growth ETF, because I know down the road, you know, like when I look into like real estate or this and that, um, I'm going to be, you know, not hesitant, you know, to liquidate that fund and put it into real estate. Cause I know that it'll be going towards another investment and I know that, you know, it's an ETF. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I suppose just just different asset classes aren't they it doesn't mean that you're well in terms of growth maybe one is better than the other but in terms of like what you maybe require for the future they're just both investments just different types in terms of real estate versus versus stocks um so what about i don't know the answer may be no, nothing but do you have like any stocks hovering on your watch list at the moment that you you may be interested in now i'll, I'll answer first there are a couple for me but um, I'm more focused right now on adding to my current positions rather than introducing a new one. I, I keep hearing that I should look more into SoFi. I keep hearing, and, and I've, um, looked into it a little bit and it's interest in new holdings, which is another, you know, fintech based company. Um, I also think that, that you kind of said this earlier, actually, some of the more defensive companies I think will do well and energy companies, maybe midterm, um, with everything going on in the world, you know. I kind of have exposure to that from Palantir anyway, but I'm keeping my mind, you know, open to that. But yeah, what about, what about you? Is there anything that you're interested in at the moment that you haven't um, actually taken that step? Funny enough, as I was looking at Palantir now, I had Palantir probably like a few years ago, Ooh. you know, like when I like IPO'd and then yeah. you know, I was doing great and then it wasn't. Mm -hmm. but I think I had, I had like close to like a thousand shares and I sold oh, it I know, but I sold it at a loss. That's the only thing. Uh, but then I put that money into like the tech stocks and then it rebounded. But You're fine. at the time, that's when I realized like, um, IPOs could be very, you know, dangerous. They mm -hmm. grow great in the beginning. 
certain IPOs that have done well, like Kava, uh, Shark mm -hmm. Ninja, which is another one. And I never thought Shark Ninja would perform well. Um, you know, it's like they Shark sell. Ninja. Yeah, Shark Ninja. It's a U.S. based As company. The appliance company. Oh yeah, they they are oh, like okay. high value truckloads. They're very expensive truckloads here, and they sell all of those at Costco. So mm -hmm. um, they don't just sell vacuums; they sell also like coffee machines. And I'm like, wow, they're really entering like different spaces here. But their stock has done well. Um, and I looked into them like, yeah, they look like a solid company, but, you know, like these IPOs, it's kind of hard to know, like, is it going to do well after IPOs? Mm -hmm. Is it going to fall off a little bit? It typically um, goes like that, doesn't it? It goes. Like yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like sometimes it bottoms out for a little bit and then it just kind of recovers. So it's yeah. really hard to say. Um, one of the other stocks I noticed is done well, like Duolingo. It's like that mm, language yeah. stock. Like I do it every day, like when I'm, I'm trying to like learn Italian. Amazing. And I'm like, is it publicly traded? And I know it's been doing extremely well. I said, I don't think there's many other companies uh, or competitors that can compete with Duolingo. Plus, it's mm -hmm. very user friendly. And I think we could, when it comes down to convenience, uh, most companies are going to win when it's convenient. Like, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Rosetta. It's mm -hmm. like a, yeah. Yeah, Rosetta, a big like, box. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's not very convenient, right? Yeah, and I need true. people in the past to use that. And just about everyone went to Duolingo because it's mm -hmm. free. And you can learn almost any language you want. The Rosetta is more of an inconvenience to buy for one language. So that's when I realized, like, okay, these companies are basically solving an issue. They're solving a problem. And, you know, like when you look at Palantir, they're like very AI, you know, heavy. Mm -hmm. And when I started like doing like a deeper dive on it, I realized like, wow, their technology is like amazing. Like they provided the um, technology, I think, to track people in Europe during COVID. Yeah. I don't know, something like that. And then, especially here in the United States, they have like, they're getting a lot of military contracts. Um, yeah. I think Border Patrol is using their uh, technology as well. I'm like, I didn't realize how many contracts they've had, like private contracts. Oh, so yeah. really I think diversified. I'll, yeah, I think honestly, if they're getting government contracts long term, mm -hmm. I think Palantir will do just fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I obviously agree with you. Very interesting that you spoke about Shark Ninja there because as soon as you said it, I thought of the appliance. The appliances that they sell but i never knew honestly i never knew this might make me sound very silly that they were a publicly traded company and you could invest into their stock and i actually own one of their air fryers so very oh. interesting <laughs> and they've done really well looking at them and you made some great points there about duolingo um yeah absolutely the world is moving towards convenience and any company that can offer that on a uh, commercial level or on a government organizational level you know they have they have a place um, is there anything else you want to say about investing and stocks? Anything else that you think is worth speaking about? Because if not, I want to quickly move on to, um, it sounds really weird for people listening, but I want to talk to you about diet a little bit more. Uh, oh, is there okay. anything else in terms of investing first? Um, I would just say if you're investing, invest consistently, invest, Absolutely. you know, what's comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, you've got to just bring it back to, to the simple stuff. I think a lot of people try and confuse it too much, but many people have seen a lot of success just by doing the very basics that are required for, for the stock market. Okay, well, let's shift the conversation. The reason I, I've never spoken to anyone on a podcast about diet before, so this is going to be very interesting. But I notice that sometimes on X, um, you, you post about sort of the things that you're eating, the things that you're maybe avoiding. And there's a lot of, uh, I guess, similarities between the way that we both live our lives maybe i'm not as stringent as you are i don't know but when did you start paying attention to what you're eating and like what main things did you cut out and what, what are you now focusing on and i'll chip in and say if it's the same for me um yeah I, exactly when i was a funny story when i was um at a wedding in massachusetts back in like 2017 i used to eat a lot of sweets it was just like a lot of people have a sweet tooth mm -hmm. and you know long story short i got very sick one night because mm -hmm. i was eating a lot of ice cream and wow, you've eaten a lot yeah, actually, it was 2016, and I was I got very sick, you know, high fever, whatnot, wasn't feeling well, and then I realized, yeah, sugar is not good for you, so mm -hmm. I just went cold turkey from there, and I just started eating, you know, healthy stuff, um, you know, like your meats, your poultry, your nuts, f fruits and vegetables, and then I basically haven't touched any of that stuff in, like, the last eight plus years, wow. so, like, when it comes to, like, donuts, I don't have any urges, I don't have any cravings, mm -hmm. um, I do like my salty foods, like mm -hmm. burgers, pizza, I don't think anyone can really disagree there. No. <laughs> but for the most part, um, I do notice like 
when you eat foods that have, you know, high fructose corn syrup, um, mm -hmm. a lot of sodium, um, processed sugar or high fats, like, pro like, you know, unhealthy fats, it produces a lot of inflammation. Mm -hmm. And I notice a lot of people I know who trade a lot and like, who are, you know, fairly like healthy, they try mm -hmm. to control, you know, like what they eat. Because if you eat unhealthy food, you're creating a lot of inflammation. And a lot of times that inflammation goes to your brain, it goes to the rest of your body, like your, um, um, a lot of times your joints. So a lot of times yes. your joints hurt and it's yeah. not very enjoyable. So it's like, Hey, like, okay, cold showers, you know, not for everybody, but it feels great. Yeah, I don't do know. that Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't disagree. I like hot showers, but you know, cold showers for me, usually most of the time. Um, and then I got into like, you know, juicing where, mm -hmm. you know, you, um, what do you call it? Like I juice like ginger and okay. lemon. Mm -hmm. I take those shots. Funny enough, um, I don't know if you have Trader Joe's out where you are. No, but I know, I know what they are. Trader Joe's, they sell like those little like, you know, pre-packaged like shot things where... Oh yeah, like ginger and... Yeah, ginger, turmeric and everything. So mm -hmm. they sell for like $3 a piece. I'm like, I'm not yeah. paying $3. So I go to the store and I buy a bunch of ginger root. I bought, I, we have a lemon tree, so that's great. Mm -hmm. And I'll juice that down and I'll mix it with like apple cider vinegar, which is also like, you know, yeah. great for digestion. <clears throat> And <clears throat> I'll take shots of that every day. And I notice the inflammation in my body has just been like completely just diminished. Mm. And it's great because if you keep the liver healthy, then almost no illness can hit your mm. body. So usually they recommend like one of those shots a day. I take about three to four a day, usually like in the morning, you know, after work and then mm -hmm. before I go to sleep. And I notice like I have like almost no inflammation in my body. Like you work out. You take it, almost no inflammation. You don't feel sore the next day. So, mm. yeah. So interesting. So, so interesting. I've been on I've been on a right journey with it myself as well. Um, so back in, oh, I don't know how old I was. Maybe when I was like 13, I want to say. Maybe, yeah, we'll say 13. I, I was young. Um, I decided that I would become a vegetarian. And it was, you know, before that, I didn't really eat much meat anyway, just because of the household I grew up in. I, you know, I won't bore you with details, but I wasn't a heavy meat eater. Decided through a school project that I would cut it out completely. And I remained that way up until um, not that long ago. So I was vegetarian for 13 years, 12 years, a long, long time. And within within that period of time, I also uh, had little stints trying to be a vegan. I had a long stint where I was a pescatarian, where I introduced fish because I traveled to Korea for three weeks and I kind of had to. Um, and it was a big part of my life, you know. I was, a long, long time, I didn't eat meat. I didn't really, I've never eaten, an, obviously now I have, but I'd never eaten a steak in my entire life. You know, there was a, because I came from a family that, you know, didn't eat steak, so that... <clears throat> That wasn't abnormal anyway to me. And I, I started just noticing, and, and, and this, again, was my normal at the time. And it's not until I reflect that it was really abnormal. I just thought, I'm always so tired, no matter how much sleep I get. I'm always feeling, not always, but I go through uh, th phases of feeling quite dizzy, quite just a bit unwell for no apparent reason. You said there about joints hurting. My joints would ache. You know, I'm, I'm 28 now, but back then it was like, you know, you're, you're 26, you're 25. Why on earth are your joints hurting? Like, that's not normal. Um, yeah, just brain fog. You know, there's lots of different symptoms and they were very normal at the time. And I just did some research and, you know, I guess mass media, again, is not great for alternative living styles. They want you to eat a certain way. They want you to live a certain way. But when you dig in a little bit deeper and you hear case studies of people that have tried different things and how they're seeing it, it, it makes you interested, you know. And I've always been someone that's very open-minded. I'll try it before I make my own judgment. So I, I reintroduced meat. And at this point, I was already eating fish, but I reintroduced meat and I started slowly. And I, you know, then pretty much over time have gone to a diet now where I try to avoid as many carbs as I can, as much seed oil as I can. I primarily focus on you know, dairy, meat, fish. Um, I'm not going to lie. I'm no saint. You, I think you're in a better position than me. I definitely do have some chocolate and some candy or sweets. Um, I have a sweet tooth as well. I, I do have some things that maybe aren't as good. But I think the main thing is the majority of the time I'm, I'm, I'm trying, you know, I am getting most of my calories from steak, from beef, from chicken, from fish. And what's really interesting is as soon as I have a day where I eat 
let's say I eat a, a sandwich with, um, I don't know, fries on the side and I then eat a dessert and it's a very sugary dessert. I have seed oils, I have something deep fried. I can almost without a doubt know that all those symptoms are coming back the next day. It's crazy what a difference it makes. And I think one of the main things that I noticed was before, before I was eating meat again, I would always kind of get um, a bit of a, a bit of a slump, the afternoon slump. Now I don't really get that. I don't really see a dip in my energy. My energy is very, very constant, you know? And being a woman as well, I've noticed a lot of um, benefits in terms of pain and stuff. Like you, if any women are listening to this, which I, I doubt they are, most of my audience are, are men, but if you are and you're struggling with pain and stuff, look at your diet. I think we both agree that actually you can solve a lot of issues. You, you mentioned it about the liver just through eating maybe like our ancestors ate, rather than things that aren't natural, that we're being told are good for us. I went off on a tangent there, Joe, but I don't get to speak to many people about this, so I'm quite passionate. <laughs> no, you, you definitely should be passionate. That's honestly great. You're, I think you're outperforming 99% of the people when it comes to your diet, and there's nothing wrong with you know chocolate or a little bit of sweets once in a while. It's, uh, it's good to have like a treat. Like My treat would be like pizza or maybe a yeah, hamburger mm -hmm. but you like you gotta you gotta enjoy yourself once in a while chocolate is not a bad thing too you know once in a while you got your antioxidants in it mm -hmm. okay it's sugar but still like in like every food we eat nowadays there's always going to be something in it especially like the seed oils mm -hmm. i've been like a big seed oil disrespecter mm -hmm. because you know like i like my olive oil like my fish oil i've gotten really heavy into coconut oil mm -hmm. and i just feel amazing like eating that stuff so it's it's really great that you're you know you're doing this consistently yeah i'm trying it's been a big shift and it's it's not easy i've had to obviously learn how to cook different meals that i've never had to cook before and you know it's opened up a whole new world but it, it, it's very interesting how impactful it, how impactful diet can be um but yeah, let, let's round it up then because I've realized we're hitting the hour mark and you've only just started your Saturday where you are. So you've, you get to go out and enjoy it. Uh, but where can people find you? They can find you on X and YouTube and Spotify. Am I missing anything else? Um, yes, that's that's basically you nailed it. Yep, X, Spotify, mm -hmm. YouTube. Um, just I'm always here on X, you know, always investing, always looking to network and connect with new people, mm -hmm. new mindful people. So yeah. Cool. Well, all of Joe's links will be in the description below. I do recommend you go and give him a follow. Definitely go and listen to his episode, which I'll, I'll leave linked actually so you can find it easily, um, where he actually shares his journey in a lot more detail to how he's actually got to the point that he's at now in terms of investing. And yeah, thank you, Joe, for joining me. It's been a wonderful conversation and I look forward to doing it again. Thanks again, Haley. Pleasure to be thank on you and I'll talk to you next time.